Hello and welcome to the city of London, a city within a city. People think about London as the great metropolis that we all know, but within it is something called the city of London. It goes back many, many hundreds of years and it's the epicenter of the global financial system, if the truth be told. It's more than that, however. It is the center of a global web of secret societies that control the planet today. And they come uh, from a series of interbreeding bloodlines which you can trace back to the ancient Middle and Near East thousands and thousands of years ago. And the staggering truth is that these interbreeding bloodlines under different names have increasingly controlled planet Earth from that time to this, never more so than today. In the next few hours on this video, you're going to be introduced, if you've not already read the book, uh, my book, The Biggest Secret, to some staggering, stunning, and I'm the first to say, bizarre information. The basis of the video is an interview with a lady called Arizona Wilder, who was brought up and mind controlled from uh, almost the time that she was born uh, to eventually, as she did, conduct satanic rituals at the highest level of the satanic ritual network, involving some of the most famous people on the planet. But we'll get into that as we go along. It is bizarre, and that's not even the most bizarre uh, uh, aspect of this story, which I'll come to as we progress. But the bizarre just happens to be true. And this video is designed to be a companion to my book, The Biggest Secret, and you'd get more out of the interview with Arizona if you've read that book. But what I'm going to do to start with is just set up a few basic uh, background details that can allow you, if you've not read the book, to follow uh, the story and the revelations that Arizona is going to unfold for us. As I say, this is not just a City of London financial district. It is the center of a global web. It is the spider in the center of the web, as I expose in great detail in The Biggest Secret and a previous book, And the Truth Will Set You Free. And what the basis of that shows is that all these apparently different companies, banks, insurance companies, uh, political parties, actually at the top of their pyramids interlock and are controlled by the same few people. About 13 families run the world and uh, offshoots of these bloodlines under different names. Just give you an example and a little guided tour of where we actually are because that's um, a good example of what I'm talking about. Behind me is the Bank of England. This was uh, uh, created in a charter signed by uh, William of Orange, who became William III, uh, the King of England, in 1688-1689, and he was one of these bloodlines. And from the moment that uh, he took the uh, throne, then the whole thing started to really epicenter in London. This is when the, the spider at the center of the web really moved in here. So we've got the Bank of England behind me, um, which was created thanks to William uh, of Orange and the people that controlled him, because these guys are just puppets, of course. Over there, we've got the NatWest building. It's one of the big clearing banks um, in England. Um, if you just come around this statue, which I'll come to in a second, behind me there is the Mansion House. That's the centre of government in the city of London, this city within a city. And um, at the top, uh, you'll see uh, the red uh, cross on the white background, uh, the flag, it's the flag of England, and that uh, symbol goes back right into the ancient world. It was the ancient sun symbol of the Phoenicians uh, back in the uh, ancient uh, Middle and Near East, and uh, the Phoenicians had a number of deities. One of them was called uh, Barati, uh, the female. One was called Barat, the male. Bharati and Barat became Britannia and Britain because the British culture was brought here by the Phoenicians about 3000 BC and after. And also they had deities, the Phoenicians, called St. George of Cappadocia who killed the dragon. That became St. George of England um, and that's of course the flag of St. George, the red cross and the white background today. 
Also, the Christian uh, deity called St. Michael was an ancient Phoenician uh, deity long before Christianity. So, the Mansion House, the center of government, um, is a very, very powerful place. We go around here, we've got the uh, Royal and Sun Alliance Insurance Company, the banks and the insurance companies interlock and as a result of the fantastic amount of wealth that they can move around the financial markets every day, these interlocking organizations control the world financial system. If a stock market goes down and crashes, it's because it's meant to crash. And not everyone loses, you know, when that happens. If you know it's going to crash, you sell your stock, it crashes, you buy it back at a lower price, you then push it back up again and buy other stock at the same time at a few cents on the dollar or whatever. And that means that a financial crash can actually lead, if you know it's coming because you're creating it, to amazing, uh, an amazing expansion of your holdings and your wealth. Over there, we've got the Lloyds Bank building. That's uh, another one of the big clearing banks, which all interlock and are controlled by the same people. And then uh, there we have the uh, Royal uh, Guardian Exchange uh, building, another major insurance company, which, like I say, interlock with all the others. And then we come back uh, to the Bank of England. Now, this financial center uh, along with places like Wall Street, where the bloodline families interlock again, the same people run America, as run Britain, as run Germany, etc. They have funded many, many times both sides in wars. And ironically and uh, sickeningly, uh, behind me, opposite the Bank of England, in the center of this square, is a memorial to those who died in the two world wars. Let's just go and have a look at that. What uh, happens uh, in terms of creating wars is a technique, a mind manipulation technique that I've called in my books problem, reaction, solution. Uh, and it works like this. If you want to introduce something, say centralization of power through the United Nations, uh, centralization of power militarily with uh, NATO, the North Atlantic uh, Treaty Organization, the biggest uh, military organization in the world that's expanding all the time. If you want to centralize power into fewer and fewer hands, if you did that openly and said this is what we want to do, there'd be a reaction against that. People would say, hey, this is a fascist state you, you want to uh, create. We're not having this. But through this technique of problem, reaction, solution, you can actually manipulate people to demand you do what you want to do anyway. So um, it works like this. First of all, you create the problem, but you get someone else to be blamed for it. You then uh, report that problem uh, through the media in the way you want it reported, because the media is owned by the same people that own the banks and etc. You get the public to react to your problem by saying something must be done, this can't go on, what are they going to do about it? And at that point, they, who have covertly created the problem and blamed someone else, who've gleaned that reaction of do something, then offer the solution to the problems they have created. So if you take the world wars, um, after the first world war, in which the financial centers of London and Wall Street, etc., funded all sides, power on this planet was in fewer hands than ever before. After the second world war, it was even fewer hands uh, on the wheels of power. And as a result of the Second World War, we had uh, the creation of the United Nations, we had the creation of NATO, and we had this great centralization of global power. Problem, reaction, solution. This is a wonderful example. Here you've got this memorial in the center of this edifice of global power, and it says to the immortal honor of the officers, non-commissioned officers and men of London, who served their king and empire in the Great War, 1914 to 1919. This memorial is dedicated in proud and grateful recognition by the city and county of London. I'm sure it is, because as a result of the sacrifice they made, um, power in, in the world came into fewer and fewer hands, not least into this area I'm talking uh, in now, and also made a fortune, because not only does it create problem, reaction, solution, when you uh, lend money to both sides, um, 
they then have to pay you back that money plus interest. When both sides have devastated each other's countries, they borrow more money from you so that um, they can rebuild their shattered countries. Therefore, um, power equals control of money in the world as it is today, and the control of money comes through debt, and wars create massive amounts of debt, therefore massive amounts of control. It says here, their name liveth forevermore. Total bullshit. People who are manipulated to fight wars are merely pawns in a game they don't understand. D the bottom here, it talks about uh, the memory of those who died in the Second World War, 1939 and 1945. How ironic and how sick that that war was manipulated and funded to a large extent from this building here, the Bank of England. The governor of the Bank of England at that time was a guy called Montague Norman, a very, very close friend of Hitler's banker, and it was uh, the Bank of England, Wall Street, and the transnational corporations which had German subsidiaries, not least the Rockefeller Standard Oil in America. Um, Rockefeller's another one of these bloodline families, along with the Rothschilds and others. It was those companies and banks that funded Hitler and allowed him to build a war machine that cost literally millions of lives. And before we move on um, and expand this story, on the other side of this square is another very appropriate statue. It's of the Duke of Wellington. The Duke of Wellington uh, fought the Battle of Waterloo against Napoleon. And this is a wonderful example again of the way the financial markets are manipulated to this day. What happened was that the House of Rothschild was funding Wellington and also funding Napoleon. And what they did was they arranged, because communications weren't uh, anything like they are today, of course, uh, back then. What they did, they made sure that they knew the outcome of the war, or the Battle of Waterloo, uh, before anyone else in this uh, uh, area of London did. So they found that Wellington, the Duke here, another bloody puppet, they haven't got the strings on the statue, unfortunately, so it's not accurate. Um, they realized that Wellington had won the Battle of Waterloo. What they did, however, was put the rumor out um, in this area that Napoleon had won the Battle of Waterloo. As a result, there was a panic, stocks fell, there was a crash. What were the Rothschilds doing quietly, secretly? They were buying up all the stock they could at those crashed prices. And then along came the real story. Wellington had won the Battle of Waterloo. As a result, the panic was over. All those stocks rose in price. And the Rothschilds were not only fantastically richer, they owned uh, vast amounts uh, more uh, of the economy of this country and in a much uh, wider area of Europe. So the manipulation of the financial markets, that's just an example uh, from the last century, um, is uh, very much going on to this day. And it's manipulating your life, what your money will buy, and indeed if you have any money at all. And I'll just finish at this location by focusing yet again on the mansion house. Arizona Wilder, um, the subject of this video um, conducted satanic ritual at the highest level and we'll come to that in detail you'll see that in the interview um, but it's very much part of these bloodlines that have increasingly controlled the planet over the last few thousand years when you follow them through from the ancient near and middle east up into europe where they became the european aristocracy and the royal families of europe or royal family, if the truth be told, because they're just the same bloodlines under different names, um, over to America and into the modern world, one thing follows again and again. Human sacrifice, satanic ritual, blood drinking, and all this stuff. And I've talked to a number of people who have um, seen these rituals in the city of London, who have been subjected to some of them, and um, the Mansion House, the centre of government in the city of London, is one of the key places where it goes on uh, around here uh, when uh, work here is finished for the day. And satanic ritual is very much part of the next topic I want to raise and talk about at another location, and that's mind control. A few can only control 
billions and the direction of their lives if they manipulate the way we think and manipulate the way we feel. Only by doing that can they control us because there's not enough to do it physically. And so mind control is the foundation of how it's done and we'll talk about that at the center of global mind control at the center of the network that uh, generates it and that's the Tavistock Institute not far from here yet again in London. Well we're now just a short drive from the city of London next to this very appropriate poster very bad things and I'm on my way to the Tavistock Institute. Um, it is the center of global mind control and the network that does the research and creates the data and advances the techniques to mind control people in many ways. When you think about mind control, you might think of the, the Manchurian candidate and some robot with a gun, kill, 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 kill. But mind control is much bigger than that. If you take the definition of mind control to be manipulating the way people think and therefore behave, then the question is not how many people um, are mind controlled on the, in the world, it's how few are not. Because every time you read a news story, which is slanted to get you to see the world, a person or an event in a certain way, and you accept that slant and take it as truth, you're being mind controlled. Every time you uh, see an advertisement and it persuades you to buy something you don't really need, you're being mind controlled. So all these different techniques are used all the time to get us to think and behave the way this few, this clique, this elite want us to. Problem, reaction, solution. Getting us to react to events and demanding solutions, um, the solutions the elite want us to demand, that's also mind control. So mind control is a vast, vast subject. And you know in the, uh, in the streets of the cities of the world, or the towns of the world, you get these people with the, the clipboards that are asking you questions called opinion polls. Well, we're led to believe that uh, these opinion polls are to get uh, a feel for what people want so that we can give the people what they want. No, no. Overwhelmingly, those opinion polls are designed to find out if the programming, the manipulation of the public opinion of the uh, collective consciousness is actually working. So uh, they'll ask your opinion on various subjects and if 80% um, say, yeah, we think in this certain way about this subject, okay, the programs work, brilliant. If only 40% think that way, then the question is, the manipulators ask, what more do we have to do to get more people to think the way we want them to think? So. It's all about mind control and emotional manipulation. That's how it works. And we've just uh, reached a point here, um, a military establishment. The Honorable Artillery Company Headquarters, SUF. What is the military, what is the training for the military except fundamental mind control? What happens uh, when you go through the training, especially in the elite organizations like the SAS and the Parachute Regiment in this country or the Delta Forces in the United States? It is to get human beings to give their thinking processes away to those in the peak caps that have more stars or more stripes on their arm. And you, you want people in the military to so give their mind away that when someone in a peak cap says shoot this group of people then without saying well why or what have they done to me or whatever it's <laughs> all over yes sir yes sir the yes sir mentality mind control and if those people had a drink with the op opposition the opponents the enemy they'd probably get on fine but they don't get to that stage because when the peak cap says shoot, they shoot. They are mind controlled. And this is what the military is about. Um, so you have mass mind control, you have individual mind control. And I'm just going to now walk just around the corner from here and take you to the headquarters of global mind manipulation. Mind control has been known about for a very, very long time. And to understand many of the things that Arizona will be talking about in the interview, you just need to explain one of the fundamental techniques of mind control. It's called trauma-based mind control. 
there is a mechanism in the mind that shuts out the memory of trauma. You know when you, um, you have a, uh, a car accident and you can't remember what happened before the trauma of the actual accident and immediately afterwards? That's because the mind puts an amnesic barrier around trauma. Now that's very, very good because obviously we don't want to keep reliving and re-remembering um, severe trauma like accidents and horrors of that kind. But this they began to understand massively in the concentration camps of Germany under the guy known as Joseph Mengele, the angel of death, the infamous uh, mind manipulator and geneticist. They began to understand that it, you, if you could systematically traumatize someone, particularly before the age of five and six, then you could turn their mind into a honeycomb of self-contained compartments, amnesic barriers which were unaware of the existence of the others. And if through uh, hypnotic keys, triggers, uh, words, signs, whatever, you could pull one of these amnesic barriers to the front to become the conscious level, that could experience something or be programmed to do something robotically, and then that compartment could be pushed back in the mind and another one pulled forward. Now this new one has no idea the other compartment exists, let alone what it's experienced or what it's been programmed to do. This has become known as multiple personality disorder, or DID, dissociative identity disorder, which is much more appropriate. And for short, these people are known as multiples. And this is some of the uh, terms that Arizona will be using um, in the interview. Now we've reached a point here, if we just turn around, uh, of the headquarters of the Global Mind Control Network. This is the Tavistock Institute in Tabernacle Street, 30 Tabernacle Street in London. It was this network and is this network that coordinates the mind control program around the world, both on a mass and individual uh, level. The background to this organization um, is this. It used to be uh, part of the British military psychological warfare department, appropriately and it was developed by a guy called Dr. John Rawlings Reese. And other uh, parts of the network were established around the world. Stanford um, in America is one of them. And together they coordinate the mass mind manipulation of the human race and mind program people on an individual level. Um, just to give you an idea, these mind control people are overwhelmingly those that do the assassinations. Why is it always a lone nutter? Um, that's responsible for assassination. So people say, oh, he was just a nutter. Um, no conspiracy, no more investigation necessary. Why is it that the same psychological profile keeps turning up all over the world with guns, going crazy with guns in the street, killing people, creating problem, reaction, solution situations in which legislation comes through and is introduced as a result of those horrors? Interestingly, um, Martin Bryant, the man who uh, went crazy with a gun in Port Arthur, Tasmania, just happened to be um, treated by a guy called Dr. Eric Cunningham Dax. Now, Cunningham Dax um, was the Tavistock Institute representative in Australia and a close associate for decades of Dr. John Rawlings Reese that sent the whole, whole thing going. So, when someone goes crazy with a gun or these horrific things happen, we need to ask the question, are they doing it from their own mind or are they programmed to do it because of the effect of what they do? Now, Arizona Wilder was brought up from birth in these mind control programs and her programmer was Joseph Mengele, the angel of death. And when he uh, eventually died, um, in the late 80s, because the subject of the programming becomes uh, so attached to the programmer, almost worshipping the programmer, when the programmer dies, often the programming starts to break down. It did with this lady, and that's why now she's speaking out and talking in uh, staggering detail about what she experienced and the people that she was involved with. People might find it hard to believe that Joseph Mengele was in the United States and South America after the war, but there was a, a British intelligence, American intelligence operation called Project Paperclip, which got 
people like Mengele and other leading Nazis out of Germany at the end of the war to continue their mind programming and to continue their genetic research and manipulation um, in America after the war, in the, in the uh, United Kingdom also. So this is some important background to this Arizona Wilder interview, but it's not even the biggest secret. The biggest secret is even more bizarre than that. Well, I've now come literally a few strides outside of the official boundaries of the city of London into an area known as Temple Bar, where the royal courts of justice are established. And this is the center of the British legal profession, not just the British legal profession, but the legal profession of the world, as the biggest secret um, exposes. This is where they come to the bar, as it's said, to become barristers, the top of the legal profession, and eventually to become the judges um, that are part of the network and the secret society network overwhelmingly um, who are told what to do and when you've got judges being told what to do by the secret society network what justice is there um, Temple Bar is named after the Knights Templar one of the secret societies in the ancient world that I uh, talk about in my books and, and they were part of this network and their successors are continuing that manipulation and agenda to this day now, I'm standing across the road from the Royal Courts of Justice here, outside something called the Outer Temple. This is one of the major secret societies that manipulate and uh, control the legal profession and the uh, workings of so-called justice in Britain, and indeed, like I say, further afield. But the reason I've come here overwhelmingly is to point out um, something in the center of the road here at the uh, boundary between Temple Bar and the City of London, and it's a massive uh, reptile figure, dragon figure, in the center of the road. Now, we're getting into what the biggest secret is here, because when you uh, go around London, and indeed looking at the uh, coats of arms of the aristocratic families, etc., again and again, you keep seeing reptiles, you keep seeing dragons, and you've got the serpent race and the dragon race constantly recurring in the ancient texts, um, describing the gods of the ancient world. And there is a reason for this. There is a reason why dragons appear everywhere. And that is the biggest secret, which Arizona Wilder also has experienced. Right at the start of our little tour of London, in that square outside the Bank of England, it's also possible to see again this same theme that keeps reoccurring of flying dragons, of flying serpents. We've seen one major serpent figure, serpent statue, at one entrance to the city of London near the law courts. And here I am now alongside the River Thames at another entrance to the city of London, this epicenter of global control. And what do we have to signpost the fact that you're entering the city of London? Yet another flying dragon. This one holding the shield with the red cross and the white background. This ancient symbol that I talked about um, with the flag on top of the mansion house and the flag of England, the flag of St. George. So what's going on? Why, when you look at the ancient accounts of the ancient gods, do you again and again see this reoccurring theme of the serpent race, the serpent gods, the flying serpents? Why, in my research for The Biggest Secret, have I come across a stream of people from different walks of life all over the world who have told me the same thing, that they have seen to their astonishment and amazement They've seen key people in positions of power just demanifest from being a human physical form and become before their eyes a reptile, reptilian figure. When you look at the ancient gods of the Indus Valley, they talk about the Nagas, the gods who, wait for it, had the ability to manifest as human or manifest as reptiles. This is absolutely vital to understanding parts of the Arizona interview because she has experienced exactly this. And the background to what's happening is quite simple. This three-dimensional world that we appear to live in is only one frequency, one dimension of existence. We have a frequency range which we can perceive. We call them the physical senses. But outside of that range are other frequencies, other dimensions of existence and life that are sharing the same space that we are. Um, in the space that my body is occupying now, for instance, 
um, are all the radio and television frequencies broadcasting to London. I can't see them, they can't see each other, they're not aware of each other because they're on different frequencies. Um, only when the frequencies become very close do we have what we call interference on the television or interference on the radio. And it's the same with creation. We live in conscious terms in this three-dimensional world. So this is our reality, this is what we perceive. But there are other dimensions. And the one closest to this is the fourth dimension. And staggering as it may seem, and you really have to read The Biggest Secret to see the immense supporting evidence for this, a reptilian race from this fourth dimension is the source or one of the key sources of the manipulation of this world. Uh, back in the ancient world, again documented endlessly in so many parts of the world in ancient texts and legends and accounts, uh, are the stories of how this extraterrestrial race interbred with humanity creating hybrid bloodlines. And when you do the genealogical research, you find that it is these human reptile hybrid bloodlines that actually have occupied the major positions of power through the history of the last few thousand years and today are in the key positions of power running the banking system, the business system, the politics, the military, etc. And Arizona Wilder, who had no idea of all this other information coming towards me and researching The Biggest Secret, when I met her, she said uh, and told me about how at various satanic rituals involving the most famous people in the world, um, she had seen them again and again turn into reptile figures and then come back again uh, during the ritual. I got a call from the head of an organization in America called Parents Against Ritual Abuse um, who told me again um, from her experience how many of her clients who had been uh, subjected to satanic ritual had reported the same story of how the participants had shape-shifted, as uh, the term goes, from human to reptiles and back again during the ritual. And one of the key um, areas, one of the key families identified by Arizona Wilder um, in her accounts is one not too far from here, and it's very famous indeed. And that family and that bloodline live here, or at least partly live here, Buckingham Palace, one of the many palaces and homes of the British royal family, the House of Windsor. Um, they're seen as bastions of the establishment, the British establishment, but in fact, uh, the Windsor bloodline is not British at all, it's German. It's really the house of Saxe-Coburg-Gotha. And on Prince Philip's side, um, the husband of the Queen of England, he's a uh, Mountbatten, which is really Battenberg. Again, another German line. In 1917, they changed the name from uh, Battenberg to Mount Batten, from the House of saxe coburg to Windsor, because at that time, you may recall, the German nation and the British nation were knocking hell out of each other in the trenches of northern France. And it was good PR from the British Royal Pamley's point of view to just change their name to sound more English. And this is just the, the farce and the facade uh, behind so much, uh, or behind which so much goes on. However, most people, if not almost everyone on the planet, would find the fact that the House of Windsor are one of these reptilian-human hybrid lines that shapeshift between human and reptilian form to be utterly, devastatingly ludicrous and unbelievable. I understand that, but the truth, the real truth, often is. And Arizona Wilder, in the interview that's coming up now, is going to talk about her experiences of seeing this happen. Well, I think that's all you need to know and uh, appreciate to understand the kind of information that uh, Arizona uh, Wilder is going to reveal to us now, except one thing. Across the millennium years is crunch time in this whole agenda, crunch time for the human race. This is the time when this network of interbreeding bloodlines wants to bring in its global fascist structure of a world government to which nation states would be administrative units um, of a world central bank and a world currency a, a currency that wouldn't be cash it would be merely electronic for which there are fundamental implications for human freedom 
and also the World Army, which is designed to be NATO, um, expanding and expanding as it is now, of course, to become the fully-fledged World Army, World Police Force. And underpinning that little lot is designed to be a microchip population, in which we are microchip with our financial details, our medical details, etc., etc. Um, and that would allow not only electronic tagging, people knowing where we are all the time, it would allow the external manipulation through this electronic means of our mental and emotional processes. This will happen unless the human race wakes up and wakes up fast. And to do that, we need to understand what's really going on. And to let people know that, we've got to stop beating about the bush, stop pulling punches, stop pussyfooting around, keeping information from people, oh my goodness, how will they react? and just say, this is going on, take it or leave it, make of it what you will, but this is what's going on. And some of the information you're going to hear now is quite horrific, but if we don't know about it, what can we do to stop it and to change it? I spoke to Arizona Wilder in Los Angeles, and this is what she had to say. Well, Arizona, can we start at the beginning and... and uh... Can you tell us the story of, of, of what's happened in your life from, from the very start? Um, okay, what, what I can tell you is that um, be, before I started looking into my life, um, back in 1989, I, I was starting to have flashes of things, and my life was not what it, it seemed to be, which is why I started looking into it. And um, what I found out was that I had a lot of missing time, um, and a whole lot of missing time, um, as to what 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 had occurred in my life. And when I started looking into what had happened in my life, it, it was the only way that I, at the time that I knew, was to start going to see a therapist. Within a year, um, I was talking about um, memories of being sexually abused by my father, which was part of what was it was supposed to happen. And um, I was talking then, starting to talk about uh, mind control issues, and um, I was talking about ritual abuse issues at the time and I didn't have the whole thing put together. It's taken me years, all these years, it's taken approximately almost 10 years to put this together, as what has happened to me. And in the process, I have lost everything in that, that I ever had in my life and anything I held dear in my life. Um, I was bred for this role that I fulfill and it was planned from before my birth and it was because of my the bloodline of my mother's family which comes down um, through Ireland but before that is it began in in France there it was the through the Marquis de Stock which he came to Ireland and um, changed the name to Stack and um, then I was chosen, and I, from what um, the birth was planned, my parents were forced to move down to this area for the reason that the High Council uh, is down here, which is uh, there are six councils of 13 in this country, and the High Council is down here. We're talking the United States. The United States, yes. And so from the time. That I, that, that I was um, a baby, I was being um, abused and traumatized and on purpose for the mind control that, that they need uh, someone to go through to, to do whatever they say to be as just a puppet in, in you know, that they can control every move and um, you don't remember, I didn't remember, uh, a lot of, of, of 
things because I have, as a result of all of this uh, mind control, split off many parts that all hold memories, hold feelings, hold uh, uh, programs, hold uh, information. Um, and I've been working very hard to pull all of that up. And uh, it's been a long, slow process for me because there don't seem to be a lot of people in the field that I um, only felt was the only way I could go was psychiatric and psychological. They don't seem to know what is really going on. And um, I believe that a lot of them are afraid of being sued should they suggest something. And so they cannot lead or suggest. And it's been a process of me having to trigger myself to remember. Um, and be around people that can help me with that that can't really be touched um, by the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. So what happened? Um, you say you were um, abused as a child as part of this um, compartmentalizing of your mind. Um, what, what, what went on after that as you, as you got older? Well, they start, with, uh, they start with wanting to make you an obedient slave at first and so they do a lot of sensory deprivation they do a lot of sensory overload and they switch between the two and they do out and out torture they take a small child and uh, they electroshock in my case it was electroshock to the brain um, and they would take away my uh, uh, chance to sleep. They kept me awake for many hours at night, would not let me sleep. Um, and I was also told things as uh, this was before the age of five, I was told things such as if you, they would make me drink water and they would say uh, if you um, pass urine you're going to have to drink it. And they would make me drink it. And if you if you um, have bowel movement, you're going to have to eat the feces, which is also what happened to me. And um, then they would play, there was a, a, a programmer that was programming me a very, um, a very um, infamous person in, in, in history who actually has been in this country and he was known as Dr. Green who he actually was was, was Dr. Mengele from Joseph Mengele from the concentration camps in Germany and he was kept or he stayed a lot at China Lake Naval Weapons Station out here in, in uh, Southern California in the desert area and I would be around this man a lot and he used to tell me that the uh, scar that he had on the left cheek of his face was actually from, uh, he was into fencing and that it was from that, but actually the, the scar on his cheek was from one of his own programming techniques that he would put a child in a box and tell, and with a sword and tell the child to defend the, the box, it, if, if, even if it meant his own death, then they'd tell, he'd tell another child to break into the box, and which this child would do, and then the other child would, would then jump out of the box and, and shove the sword or the lance straight through the other child. And w at one point he got in to, uh, into it where this child actually got him in the face with the sword. And uh, he had also, he would wear a big, uh, a huge emerald ring on his left hand on the middle, on this middle finger. And uh, he would twist this, this emerald around and, um, for programming and he was into using long colored ribbons and, of different colors um, and you had to choose a certain ribbon or you were given a certain ribbon and that meant that this certain thing was going to happen to you 
and it was like picking st st sticks out or drawing sticks out of a hand, you know, out of someone's hand. Um, I saw uh, games of Russian roulette played where it was chosen beforehand that a child would die and the child would put the gun up to his head and pull the trigger and this child would end up dying. But it was meant to uh, scare all of us, It'd keep us in terror as there were many other children that were around me that went through the same thing. Uh, I have run into uh, people from my childhood that, know, that have known me and I've no recognized their names and even if they changed their names I've, and, and changed their hair color, as I have done, uh, they have recognized me or I have recognized them and I know their name, they know my name, um, there is, there's just, there isn't any way for this to have happened. Uh, it's just beyond coincidence. Um, and when you get, when you get older, I mean, the, the, they start taking, this programmer in particular, Mengla, would take me to rituals. I, I went to rituals with him all over uh, this country and in Britain and in France and um, it was it was known by intelligence agencies in this country that this man was here they brought him here is that project paperclip you're talking about yeah mm-hmm through the OSS and uh, my my family or my, my so-called family uh, are all DID. They, they have not, uh, they are very well programmed and they have not sought help. They have not gone in, tried to figure out what's happened. They, they believe they've had this certain kind of life that they've had. And as far as they are concerned, I am crazy. Um, and, they have much different memories of what I have and I was always told certain things by my parents that that my sisters were never told um, and biologically I have to add at this point that my my mother is my mother I am not biologically related to my father um, and this has to do with the bloodlines and his was considered impure and this is all about purity of, of the bloodline. And uh, that is why I am involved in this. There are people that are involved in this that it is not so much because of bloodline that they have a, the ability to dissociate and be used as slaves by these people. You say that you uh, come from a certain bloodline and there is this obsession with bloodlines that this Brotherhood Illuminati have. Um, why is that? Because the what would, what first started coming out was about the Aryan, uh, the Aryans, the Aryans, and and the purity of the blood, and what it, what it's all about is that the blood and the menstrual blood contains something that is important uh, for the propagation of this race that is controlling things on this planet and there these these people that are in the organization that run that the council of, of 13 is under is and they have something called the grand druid council or the octagon is they're called the illuminati and the illuminati are actually run by these 13 bloodlines which are all of the royal families in in Europe and, and uh, in England and um, they um, need the blood because they are in fact not human they take human shape they are reptilians and they need the blood the blood helps them maintain their reptilian shape and it helps them maintain their sanity and it helps them to live in this world 
because they are not from this world. Does that relate to what the Nazis call virile power and what the uh, Hindus call the serpent power in the blood? Yes, the blood, the blood is has something. It has something in it. It has uh, secretions from from uh, the pituitary gland and from the pineal gland, and it has a um, a very strong uh, drug in it that they also. I mean, this is the one that help, that keeps them from going uh, crazy, and and they it's like it's like heroin or like endorphins, and it's much stronger. But what they need is for it to be secreted in the blood is they need terrorization of of their victims. They before they are killed for their blood. And or before, or if a, a young woman is um, beginning to menstruate, they need the menstrual blood, and it they have to terrorize them to get this to come out in the blood and be secreted in the blood. Is this the um, uh, what other people have told me about that uh, at the point of great terror, like the point of sacrifice, um, there's an adrenaline that enters the bloodstream? Is this what they they're, they're looking for? Yes, that and and this other. Uh, element comes and secretes out through the blood. This all comes out through the blood at that time, and it's at that point they are actually staring into the eyes of of the head of at, at the at some of these rituals, or at a reptilian. They are staring into the eyes of this person, and they're held. It's a hypnotic gaze these reptilians have. And it's it holds the victim in absolute an absolute trance in a trance of terror, and then um, they are killed at that moment as they are staring into their eyes. And not only do they do they they can't hold their shape when when this happens. They the human shape the human shape they cannot hold. They go back into reptilian shape. As this is happening, because it, it, it's a, it's like an animalistic um, um, type of of excitement of the kill, and they um, oftentimes they can't they they will just rip into the victim and, and eviscerate them and start uh, eating the flesh of, of, of this person too and the fat from the the uh, intestinal area is highly valued as they use it on their skin um, and they will drink and they drink the blood and the blood is highly sought after and it goes according also to rank within uh, these creatures um, as to who gets what when and um, their sacrifices have increased in in the last. Uh, it started increasing in uh, the early 80s. The amount that they were doing is increased, and uh, they use um, a lot of druidic holidays to do this. But they have other days too. They've mixed all of these satanic and. Um, what are called satanic holidays and druidic holidays and in order to have these uh, rituals which ritual seems to be important to them uh, but they also use it in order to drink this blood but they seem to need more have you any idea why it's, in it's increased since the ages? Uh, so there are changes going on in the earth it seems they're not able to hold their shape like they once were able to and people see them shape shift more and more and they need the blood to try and maintain it to try and maintain their human form I believe there's a time coming that what I what I because of what I've been told when they are not going to bother having to hold that human shape at 
as they had to before. And they want that time to come. It's almost upon us. So when you're talking about the fact that the veil is lifting on these reptilians so that people can see them um, far more easily and far more often, um, does this relate in any way to the fact that there is this um, desire to bring in this rigid structure, including microchipping and many other things, across the year 2000, um, which has become known as the New World Order? Um, is that coming in because um, it is known that the people are going to see what the game is and there has to be control of the people at that time? Yes, it's very connected. I, I started talking about the New World Order uh, back in 1990, and I was not. I was. I was very uh, psychologically and physically affected so much by what was coming out. I wasn't watching television. I didn't. I was not aware that certain individuals in this country, uh, George Bush, were talking about the New World Order. I was talking about it because it, that is what was coming out and, and knowing that, that the first time that inside of myself that I'd heard it was in conjunction with the Nazis and that came from Mengele. And um, I started realizing that there was something going on uh, and then it scared me. Uh, and. I didn't really look into it for years, but I, I, I was being harassed constantly. I was, I, I was being told. At one point, I had someone telling me that I was being, and, and who was ex Army Intelligence, ex CIA, telling me that I was being uh, monitored by the National Security Agency, and I didn't have the whole story then, so I did not totally understand why this was happening and but yet I was being followed by uh, cars or vans that said um, G12 G14 and in in this last year which has really been very hard I've been followed by G41 vans and I had to find out what those were and that is naval intelligence um, but this whole thing is going towards around the year 2000 and when they are going to establish themselves openly as a new world order and it's headed toward that and that's what everything is being prepared to and or prepared for and I have actually got uh, I've got a sleeping program right now to return because I've left, but to return for that time, and it's it's called end times programming or Janus programming. And Janus relates back to Nimrod of Babylon. Yeah, there is a group that used to be in contact with me all the time, um, and they stopped trying simply because I didn't obey them. Uh, they would be in contact with me all the time. They're called Janus which is also the two-headed Roman god of change. And their headquarters is in Brussels, Belgium, in the NATO building. And they, would, they are a group of psychiatrists and doctors who are into mind control. And they are one of the many groups involved with the Illuminati. And they would, they would contact me and tell me give me directions that I was to psychically kill this person or psychically injure this person or scare this person. They'd give me the location. And I started questioning this and I had a contact who since has um, seemed to have disappeared because she couldn't get the funding and she I had called her about this group, and, and she's the one that, that uh, was the ex-CIA, ex-Army intelligence person, and she knew about these people, and she said, yes, you're right, this is, this is what is going on.
from your experience, um, uh, being brought up in this uh, Illuminati um, environment, um, were you ever told anything about where these reptilians came from, and, and, and what is the history of it all? Uh, I was made to learn through Mothers of Darkness, which is a certain aspect of the organization, because that was an early, early part of my training, uh, the history of what was the Illuminati on, on this planet. And what I learned was that the Aryans originally were from Mars, and they came, they were, the, the reptilians came to that planet to, uh, they came from another place, they came to that planet. They came to rule because they, and, and they wanted to mix, so they said, with that race. And, um, but they became the overlords. And the Martians, or Aryans, were seeking to escape from it. They went to the moon, and then were there attacked. And they then went to Earth and established culture here on Earth approximately 6,000 years ago. And at that point in time, they were all they were doing well and they were mixing with indigenous the indigenous population of this earth they were getting along with and then about four thousand years ago the Aryan or the uh, reptilians arrived here and again began to take over uh, and they in they instilled themselves in different places uh, underground in in the uh, Earth and also this one part of them, the ruling part, took over and became involved in the politics and in the religion um, and started controlling through these means at that point in time and using the gods and deities that were believed in on this planet uh, started in infiltrating into that and becoming that and things started blood rituals started happening and uh, since that time that is the way that it has been and presently they claim to come from a Merovingian bloodline they and they are all of the there are 13 bloodlines in Europe that all, all of what are called royalty are developed from or come from and they include the Aryans in this and there's been a big push in this century um, if for example uh, when, the, when Nazis came into power, the fascists uh, talking about the purity of being pure and staying in the Aryan bloodline staying pure and what it actually is all about is keeping the blue-eyed uh, blonde or light red-haired people uh, the bloodlines pure because it is more powerful and what what is in that blood for these reptilians is more powerful and they need that and when you start mixing it with people that were indigenous to this earth, then it is not as powerful. It has nothing to do with with someone the uh, skin color or nationality. It has to do with the keeping the bloodline pure for their use. So, uh, blonde-haired, uh, blue-eyed people are, are the the purest from from the reptilians' point of view, um, and that that they want to keep that bloodline pure because of how they need to use it. Yes. Uh, when I, myself, when I realized that it had to do with blonde hair and blue eyes, I could not do anything about my eyes and I am not able to wear contacts or I would have brown eyes. But what I, one thing I did do was cut my hair off because that was part of the, the rank I was. My hair was down to my knees and I colored my hair darker. And um, there were times um, 
when after I did cut it off, they had gotten to me, and so the hair would be light red. But that is being in compliance with them. And um, I did not want to be in compliance to them. Um, I want to expose them, and I this is part of it. Uh, and I won't be what they want me to be. When you, you look at um, some of the ancient uh, accounts, like the Sumerian texts and, and many other accounts, they talk about um, the gods interbreeding with humanity. Um, is this relevant to the reptilian uh, um, way of infiltrating the human race? Yes, it is, because human beings all through the ages have accepted God's interbreeding um, or being accepted as humans, and that shows in Christianity, it shows in Judaism. It also, they have used um, Egyptology or the Egyptian religions a lot, and the, the present head of the Illuminati um, compares himself a lot with uh, the Egyptian god Osiris and Horus, which is Osiris reborn, and also uh, with the uh, Arthurian legends of the Round Table. And he takes, he has a name, the, the name that he carries from that is Pindar, which actually means Phallus of the Dragon. And the other name, Osiris, uh, he has carried because he takes the name at this time, the Marquis de Libero, which means the liberator of or from the waters. And the story of Osiris is that he was cut into 14 pieces and thrown into the River Nile. And the one piece, they, Isis found the pieces and... Um, put them back together again and she could not find the 15th piece which happened to be the phallus so a gold phallus was made and this is very important in in uh, this this whatever this group in the Illuminati this is important and it's important to, to think that about the head of the Illuminati because what comes from a golden phallus uh, would be a superior seed for a race and, and this is how this this is what what they are doing with all of these bloodlines to keep the bloodlines going are impregnating um, Aryan people of Aryan blood that hold high stations with them impregnating them with with this seed of Pendar and Therefore, it, it's important to keep this history in mind and the names in mind that he is going by at this time. So would it be correct to say that the, the reptilians came to this planet because the Aryan Martians came to this planet? And had the Aryan Martians gone somewhere else, they'd have followed them there? They would have pursued them all over the universe, yes. Can we now go into some specifics about your own experiences? Um, what were you brought up to do? You say that um, you know you were identified as a bloodline before you were born. Uh, what what was the the role that you were brought through to play? The role that I was brought through to play was um, as in in the Illuminati was as a goddess. Specifically, the address is Mother Goddess. Starfire, and the Starfire goes back to the blood in the in the uh, minstrel the minstrel blood. What what is contained in that, and the the address the, the way that I was addressed was Mother Goddess. There are only three Mother Goddesses. There can only be three at. A time in on this planet, and there is a male equivalent of which there can be only three of them. Why um, mind control someone to conduct these rituals, uh, like yourself? Um, why don't these uh, reptilians just conduct their own rituals? 
they don't seem to have the psychic abilities and they look for people that have that and people in the bloodline that have that and I've had that I've had a tremendous amount of psychic ability and so I was picked and bred from before birth and this is also something that other survivors that have been in high positions have known about me and told me what's the connection then between you having psychic abilities those being recognized um, from the start and you being brought through to conduct their major rituals well there's it's kind of twofold um, first of all they needed the psychic abilities because they control or attempt to control events because they I would have the ability to foretell what was going to happen and they needed the information to just try to, to control it to the, an outcome that was good for them. The second thing is that during the rituals um, you had to have psychic ability, you have to be very powerful in that way to call out the old ones that are also reptilian that come from another dimension they actually demon they materialize from out of another dimension and are present at rituals and they are so powerful and um, their their presence is is there's an such an evilness about them and they want out of this other dimension and they can't they they have to be called out by someone who has that power and the reptilians don't have this power that's that's very important that they don't have this power uh, to call out these uh, old ones that have to do with them and uh, what is it that, that humans have that the reptilians don't have that means they don't have the power to connect interdimensionally and, 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 and some humans do. We have the, the, we have the ability to foresee, to have, to be able to become vibrationally higher um, and see into those levels, go into those levels and um, in fact agencies use this they call it remote viewing to go that people these uh, humans have the ability to go into the past to go into the future to go to other places to astrally leave their body astrally um, and to see things that that it, uh, it and we've always had this ability and in, um, it's like having the third eye which they don't have. They don't have this ability. So these, during a ritual, these old ones are called out, um, and they are what Christianity would have called the demons. Uh, they are called out, and they there is a there is a circle that is it has a hexagon. In, in there, which is a powerful occultic symbol, and then there is a um, pentagram, and then there, in the middle of that, there is a triangle. And if you're the one calling them out, then you stand in the in the uh, triangle so that you're not devoured or taken by these creatures that come out. That creates an energy field around you which they right. can't penetrate. They can't penetrate it and, ye and they cannot get outside the pentagram. And they want out. They're always demanding to be let out. And so you have to be very powerful to keep them in line and to make them go back when it is time for them to go back. Why do the reptilians want to manifest these, these quote, demons um, at the rituals? It brings power to the rituals. It brings power to them. They are told things by these entities, and they are encouraged uh, to go on with what they're doing, and knowledge is imparted to them through these entities 
um, but it takes a person with the ability to bring them out and make them answer because they don't want to cooperate. They, they have to cooperate when the right person uh, has control over them. And that's to do with that person's um, energy and ability to use right. energy. Right, yes. You talked about the, the Aryan race coming from Mars. One expression of it seems to be very clearly what we call the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians had uh, two deities, uh, St. George, which became a British deity, um, who defeated the dragon, which seems incredibly symbolic. And also St. Michael, who, according to the legend, um, banished uh, Satan, or this negative force, into the abyss. Um, it, is this symbolism of the abyss anything to do with the fact that these uh, reptilian demons of another dimension are somehow locked in a time-space uh, prison and they can't get out, and they can only get out when they're, they're brought out in that way? Yes, they want out of that dimension. They, are, they have been thrown into that dimension and they can't leave that dimension. And that's actually what the abyss is about, is being in a different dimension. It's... Um, it's like uh, something to do with the fourth dimension and um, before I even knew for example what I was saying or I realized what I was saying I would be saying things uh, to my therapist and other survivors that the fourth dimension was a dimension to stay away from not at that time understanding the whole thing. Why do these rituals take place at certain key times of the year and so often are related to the phases of the moon? Because the moon has an influence on this planet and also the sun. These take also take place during different things that go on with the sun but the moon is it's kind of a really very cyclical thing with the moon. It, it, they, it takes place on full moons, new moons. Um, it has to do with, with the current religion or you know, what they're, that they're using the Druid uh, religion that they've taken and um, used. They still hold on to the Egyptology type of religion. They hold on to the Druidism though and they're currently calling themselves uh, Druidic or Druid and Druidism is tied in with uh, the cycles of the moon on which uh, it has to do with, the, with planting, sowing um, and uh, harvesting and it there are so there are so many days that they can use from this to their own purpose and their own end that that they bring it about there's a lot of ritual ritualization with druidism and they love ritualization so take us through one of these rituals that you conducted at the highest level of this global brotherhood what would happen there were people that were bred uh, from birth, they were bred to be ritual sacrifices. Um, I I have a problem with uh, what what they uh, uh, is said a lot today, especially by the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. That how could all of these people disappear, or how could all these babies be born? I worked with a nurse midwife. We did home births and it's very easy not to register a child when it's born and then they have these children that they're kidnapping and bringing in from other countries and no one misses them because these are third world countries and the children are the they have the most energy the purest energy the, they're the highest form of sacrifice and uh, they will terrorize these children and mind control these children and in rituals there when by the time they're brought into rituals they may be drugged or they may not be drugged or they may be in an altered state uh, because of the mind control 
and they are used as actual blood sacrifices um, during these rituals because of, again, reptilians needing their blood. And they will take various organs from the, the sacrifices um, depending on what date the ritual may, you know, what, what, what the ritual may be associated with on that date. But they will also slit the throat from the left ear to the right ear and the blood will be gathered in a goblet and it will be dispersed among the reptilians and uh, dispersed among also after that among people that are have been participating in these rituals and seem to have it even though they seem to be dissociated the uh, mostly these people are seem to be cognizant of what what they are doing are, are these rituals uh, rare I mean how many are there that say go on uh, a year. I mean, we talk there is some, of thousands of there, there are things happening every month of the year. There is not a month in this 12-month uh, system that something is not happening. And uh, it's usually, it's more than one. I mean, it's every full moon. It's, uh, I mean, and then the very important rituals are the summer solstice and the winter solstice, and then there is the vernal equinox and the fall equinox. And there is Soen, and there is Beltane, there is Imbolc in February, there is Lunasad, which is in uh, the beginning of August. Um, there's a whole week leading up to. Beltane it's, and also leading up to Soen, that's okay. called Grand Climax. So May the, May the 1st is Beltane. May the 1st is Beltane. Halloween, particularly in America, has become like a, a mini Christmas, almost like a holiday of uh, celebration with a trick and treat and all this other stuff. But what actually happens outside the public arena um, that night of Halloween and into November the 1st? Away from the public arena, there's a ritual that's taking place um, in six different locations in this country for all of the uh, councils of 13 in the area that I'm in. It is the East Side Christian Church on 7th and Temple Street in Long Beach. And it is for the, the High Council of 13. And in this country on that night, it is uh, satanic. Ritual. It's actually there are three nights in a row at that church. The first night is Halloween. What happens on the night of Halloween? That night is about the worship uh, and and homage to Satan, and that is what a lot of people in this country know the the devil to be. This is about the devil, Satan, and uh, Christianity. Uh, talks constantly. I mean, I believe they created uh, Christianity to be what it is. Um, and so they also have created this Satan. And so they control in that way. And on that night, there's a lot of, of bloodshed and there are sacrifices made to Satan. There is a person who plays the part of this in this in, the, in this high council uh, that has to do with this high council? He's not on the high council, but he has to do with playing the part of Satan. He is uh, a televangelist on uh, TBN. He used to be. Uh, he filled in for a little while as a lead singer on Iron Butterfly many years ago, and he has long blonde hair. What's his name? Um, at this point, I don't recall his name. It, and it, it just, I recognize his face. I saw it recently um, on TVN, 
and then this is his cover, or he is DID, and he plays this part, uh, the great um, deceiver Satan, on that night, on Halloween, at this church. And uh, that is what happens on uh, Halloween. And I mean, what else I am to say, which is going on with Halloween in this country, it's just becoming so popular. It is also to uh, desensitize people uh, to the whole thing, and even this backlash Christian movement that wants to call it the Harvest Festival, it does not realize that the Harvest Festival has to do with uh, Druidic, Druidic uh, religion. And again, they are still doing the same thing and celebrating the Harvest Festival. That's what the Harvest Festival is about. Are, are many of the so-called Christian uh, rituals, because that's what they are, or festivals or ceremonies, are they actually... Um, to most Christians, uh, unknowing uh, representations of these satanic rituals. Yes, they are. Uh, one, for example, uh, Christmas has to do with a. Uh, it, it's a time. Um, it comes right after the winter solstice, which is a satanic or a Druidic celebration. Uh, it has to do, there's a day in there called that day which is not a day. It has to do with the killing of the old king and the birth of the new king, which is a Druidic day. Um, on the 24th and the, or the 25th at midnight, there is a ceremony that's specifically for children, and it's called the last bulb on the tree. Where does that come from? That is something that's used with children. It's part of a programming them into the whole thing. And uh, there, were, there were things that would happen to the last, the child that hung the last bulb on the tree on Christmas Eve as it was a common practice to decorate the tree on Christmas Eve. And the tree in itself is a phallic symbol. And... Uh, it's it's paganistic. Um, Christmas is based on a pagan day, and uh, back to Roman times, and and, and uh, Christians have given it. Uh, they think they have given it a Christian meaning, and it means something else, and it does not. But. There is the case uh, that with the last bulb on the tree that has something to do with what happened to this little girl, John Benet. John Benet Ramsey. Yes, John Benet Ramsey, and uh, this occurred on this night because of the day it has to do with. It comes right after the winter solstice, which is a satanic or a druidic celebration. Uh, it has to do, there's a day in there called that day which is not a day. It has to do with the killing of the old king and the birth of the new king, which is a druidic day. Um, on the 24th and the, or the 25th at midnight, there is a ceremony that's specifically for children. And it's called the last bulb on the tree. Where does that come from? That is something that's used with children. It's part of programming them into the whole thing. And uh, there, were, there were things that would happen to the last, the child that hung the last bulb on the tree on Christmas Eve as it was a common practice to decorate the tree on Christmas Eve. And the tree in itself is a phallic symbol. And uh, it's, it's paganistic. Um, Christmas is based on pagan day and uh, back to Roman times and, and, and uh, Christians have given it uh, they think they have given it 
uh, Christian meaning and it means something else and it does not. But there is the case uh, the, with the last bulb on the tree that has something to do with what happened to this little girl, John Benet. John Benet Ramsey. Yes, John Benet Ramsey. And uh, this occurred on this night because of the day it has to do with um, and the ceremony that it has to do with. And there were rituals done on that night to these little children. So that is totally tied into it. I have heard that um, Jean Benet's name uh, is relevant um, to the rituals. Do, do, do you know anything about that? Jean Day. Jean Day is a satanic deity or Satan. Jean Day is a name for Satan. Um, and that, that name is just closely closely tied in and it's so close uh, and I don't understand why it hasn't come out and no, uh, I, that I know of it hasn't been talked about but that is why she was killed on the day that she was killed and uh, her family as far as I'm concerned, her family is is involved in, in, in this and that there's always a price to be involved in it. She was the price. Um, this little girl lost her life. Can we talk about some of the um, famous names that people around the world would know who, in your experience, have um, taken part in these rituals that you've conducted? You say you've conducted them in Europe and uh, the United States. Can we start with the United States? Uh, yes. Um, I have seen at rituals, I have seen George Bush. Um, I have seen um, Madeleine Albright. I have seen Henry Kissinger. Um, I have seen uh, Ronald Reagan. Um, and I have also, by the way, uh, seen his wife. Nancy Reagan. I have seen Hillary Clinton before I knew she was Hillary Clinton uh, at the time um, at these rituals. She is involved. Um, the other people that I have named and are as I have seen shapeshift into reptilians. Uh, I have not seen Hillary Clinton actually shapeshift, but I, she is involved. Um, I have seen the two sons when they were young, the two sons of, um, of George Bush present at these rituals. Are these the sons that have become governors? Yes. One is in Florida and one is in Texas. Um, I have seen, uh, uh, did I mention Jay Rockefeller? Um, and he shapes shifts. Um, I've seen George Duke Magian and uh, Ronald Reagan again, having been governor in California. Um, there have been people um, such as Newt Gingrich, have I've seen I saw and I didn't know at the time that he was Newt Gingrich I recognized that he was Newt Gingrich when uh, Clinton came into power and after he was uh, Newt Gingrich was then elected Speaker of the House and I was horrified to realize that this man was also there I'm all of this is has um, affected me to the point I don't vote. Um, all of these people seem to all be connected to the Illuminati and I don't feel like being part of, of having anything to do with them. Presidents um, like um, uh, Carter and, and Ford and Clinton... And, I've seen um, Ford there. Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford, yes. Um, are they all reptilian bloodlines? I 
haven't seen Carter shape shift. You've seen him at rituals, haven't you? Yes. Gerald Ford, I have seen shape shift. Um, and Johnson, also. Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson. Um, also, uh, Dr. Joseph Mengele, who took me around to these uh, rituals a lot of the time, uh, was also a shapeshifter. And uh, there were also people that I, in, there are people in, uh, in the European countries that I've seen um, shapeshift and, and be involved. And this, uh, it does not, it doesn't surprise me any more than it does the, uh, the people in this country doing it is just for some reason more shocking and, and it, it cuts even deeper um, because I've seen the Queen Mother there and I have seen uh, um, the Queen there, I've seen uh, Princess Margaret there, I've seen Charles there um, and they shapeshift and I have seen um, this, I, and I'm not, I'm not coming up with his name right now, but he was president in France after de Gaulle. He was there. I've seen him there. Um, I've seen uh, the Rothschilds there. I used to see uh, the Rothschild that lived in England there, but the one that still goes there and is a shapeshifter, Guy de Rothschild, Baron Guy de Rothschild, uh, has been to all of these rituals and has been over in this country under the name of Dr. Barrington and tried to program me and has, tri and has impregnated me several times with eggs that were taken from me years ago and were impregnated with uh, semen from Pindar and then placed back into my uterus. This has happened to me twice, uh, in, once at age 39 and this year uh, right before I turned 43. And uh, I had told my therapist ahead of time before I ever could have known that this had been done to me. And uh, it's happened at a certain place in, in where I have been living in the, in the San Fernando Valley. It's happened at a house uh, on Tyrone Street uh, in Sherman Oaks. And my understanding is that uh, there have been other survivors that have talked about this location as having been involved with with uh, programming and so on and he has the uh, Baron Guy de Rothschild has tried to program me um, all these years he has been trying to control me get me back under control um, and the Marquis de Libero is someone else that attends all of these functions and is, since he is the one in power, he attends all these functions. Uh, I have seen Tony Blair there, um, and he shapeshifts. Um, I have seen Prince Philip there. Um, they all have their quirks um, as, how, as to how they act even uh, in their reptilian form. Um, and they all, I mean, they, they act, they don't act all like robots, but they, they have their quirks, they have their, their uh, 
uh, so-called personalities, but they are all cold-blooded. Uh, they would kill at the drop of a hat. Um, I have even, since I've seen a picture of some people on that are talking about this subject, I've seen them. I've, when I've seen their pictures, I've recognized them. I, I did a double take a few weeks ago when I saw again someone who's been talking about around this subject, and it seems to be uh, popular right now. Who's that? Uh, this man by the last name of Sitchin. Uh, I've seen at rituals, and he is a shapeshifter. And um, I did a double take when I saw when I saw him, the picture of him because I recognize him. And uh, there's another person that I've seen. Uh, um, this uh, gardener, uh, Sir Gardner. That Lawrence Gardner. Sir Lawrence Gardner. Uh, and he had recently written an article uh, that was out in Nexus magazine. Uh, part of it was about uh, the menstrual blood, and what really triggered me was when he ca called it Starfire. Because that is one of that is the name of one of the aspects of the three uh, women who are are the, mo the dressed mother goddess. That is my name in in all of this. Um, so this man I have seen. He has lots of power in within this uh, sect. Uh, reptilians, um, and he's someone that is you would want you would want to watch out for um, out outside of this too. Um, as is this Sitchin person. Um, what do you remember about uh, Zachariah Sitchin? Zachariah Sitchin was someone in. The rituals who are in attending the rituals, who was not a major player in in as far as the rituals went, but was someone that that others present did not make remarks at or were very careful as to what they said around him, and um, he was talking about. He would be talking about um, doing away with people, uh, persons that that were in his way or were not were putting out information that that he didn't feel that he wanted put out. Um, he he is very much a disinformer, um, and that is his job to disinform about what is going on with the Illuminati and with the reptilians. He actually warned me off from investigating the reptilians, interestingly. Um, where do the rituals take place that you've been involved in, uh, involving the, the, the British royal family? Uh, Glamis Castle, Stonehenge, um, Balmoral, Castle. Um, I have, have reason to believe there was a there's a church, and I think it may be Westminster Abbey. Um, and there is a, a Mothers of Darkness castle or chateau in Brussels, Belgium. They've been there too, and also in France. Uh, the Marquis de Libero Pindar has a castle in the uh, Alsace-Lorraine region of France, and I believe it's in the Alsace region uh, that he uses, and and there are certain rituals done at that castle down 
in the dungeon part of that castle and there's an entrance down there to uh, underground uh, places in the earth and there is a natural uh, formation of rocks that kind of glow green and there they keep menstrual blood in that uh, formation and it this green uh, glowing from these rocks actually turns the blood a darker color and it's called black blood and it's used in certain rituals but there are also they they keep small there are smaller less developed little um, reptilians that are kept down there they're kind of pets but one other thing that's also down there they have there are eggs it's like a, a, a nest of eggs kept down in that in that part where it's warm it's very warm down there in this in the, into this entrance and uh, these eggs are kept down there incubating and they're rep they are the reptiles eggs and uh, that's where they they keep them what are your memories of conducting the rituals um, for the royal family? Um, uh, what happened? What, what were they doing? Um, one thing that, that sticks out in my mind um, is that there was before this was back this was back in, in uh, the late 70s um, it, this was before Charles was married to Diana he was involved with Camilla Parker Bowles and she is does not shapeshift but she became pregnant by Charles and she produced a baby um, and this baby was presented at the ritual and killed and that is the price uh, the firstborn between these two and uh, eventually these two will marry and that that is that is the price that is to be paid the the sacrifice of the firstborn between the union of these two people and uh, I've seen that there. I something else that sticks out in my mind is that some it was sometime it was around uh, the late 80s that I saw a very kind of dark man that I, I that I he was Arabic. It seemed to be Arabic or, or Egyptian or and I, I heard the name Fayed being mentioned and uh, the Queen Mother was there and I called her the Black Queen and she and he were talking very seriously and at some length about a subject they were mentioning uh, Diana and they were mentioning his son Doty and at the time I didn't know who Doty was I knew who Diana was I never saw her at any rituals um, where did this conversation take place this took place at Balmoral Castle um, and I heard them talking about a marriage between these two and I thought at the time, well, she's married to Charles. Can there be a marriage when she's married to Charles? I didn't understand why the 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 uh, Queen Mother and uh, uh, this person that I now know to be Dodi Fayed, because I heard Fayed, 
um, Mohammed Al Fayed um, talking, and I had seen them together at. Uh, I saw them at Balmoral Castle. I overheard the conversation at Balmoral, but I'd seen them also at uh, Mothers of Darkness uh, Chateau in Brussels, and they were talking about uh, a union between Diana and uh, his son Doty back in the late 80s, and I did not understand at that time because I understood Diana to be married to Charles. I knew that she was married to Charles and they had two children. And uh, they were about to have another. Um, and uh, the Queen Mother, I picked, I, all I could pick up was that, that for some reason that there was a malevolence towards Diana, and uh, Diana I had never seen at a ritual. Um, I wondered what she knew about all of this. What have you seen um, the royal family do, the queen, the queen mother, and uh, the other people you've seen in the rituals? What, what have you seen them do? I've seen all of them drink human blood and consume human flesh and uh, they have their own um, goblets in which they have blood and these, these goblets are encrusted with jewels um, and they also have their own daggers and that, that the dagger goes into the goblet and they stir the blood around with it, and it, it's also a, um, what it is, it's a symbol of the, of the phallus going into the vagina when they're doing this. And um, I've seen them do this, and they, some of them have even, like the, the uh, queen mother I saw with, she had her own, um, little, I, I would, like, almost, it's between a, a very elaborate ornate chair or a throne kind of thing brought in for her to sit. And um, because before these rituals actually start, um, there is a kind of uh, people um, move around the room and talk, um, or, or recognize one another. It's a formal kind of a ritualistic setup. The way they talk and the way they they intro they're introduced. They introduce each other. It's like a court. What are they wearing? They're wearing uh, robes. They're not wearing anything underneath the robes, and the robes are um, very ornate. Um, they all have, the one thing in common they have is they have a, a red color, like blood, and some of them have purple, and um, they have uh, gold uh, kinds of lines running through them. They have the, uh, the Merovingian um, symbol of France, the uh, fleur de lis um, and... Um, there are jewels that are sewn in at certain points on these robes and um, they wear these robes but they don't wear anything underneath the, the robes because what is going to happen, what the rituals are all about, they're going to shape shift and they can't have anything on under the robes and there are, there are orgy kind of things that go on at the rituals also and, um, involving the, the royal family of Britain. Yes, involving the royal family of Britain and, and the sacrifice and the eating of consuming the sacrifice and they are involved in that. You've seen them do that? Yes, I have seen them do that. People in Britain uh, listening to what you're saying um, would obviously be staggered, I guess, anywhere in the world, but what would stagger them mostly 
is um, in Britain, the Queen Mother has an image of being the nation's grand grandmother, the nice old lady and uh, good old Queen Mum, what a lovely lady. What's your experience of, of the Queen Mother? She is very cold in reality and she is very cruel and she is very um, different than she comes across to the public. Um, she's cold-blooded. Um, she, if she feels that you are someone beneath her, even uh, in the Illuminati, that you're at her equal or your station is above her, she will not speak to you, she will not recognize you. Um, she obviously, from what I see, enjoys consuming human flesh. Um, it's sickening. Um, the one person that she seems to be afraid of is Pindar. People would also look at the Queen Mother's um, elderly, frail stature and uh, find it very difficult to see uh, her taking part in rituals and doing anything, if you like, active. Um, do they go into a different state um, uh, in terms of age and strength and, and all these other attributes when they actually shapeshift? Yes, uh, the the human body that they that they choose to occupy or take when it was young, it ages. But when they take the reptilian form, they still these reptilians live hundreds of years, and so they have to have taken more than one human body to live in. Uh, there, a lot of them are much, much older, and I'm including the Queen Mother in this, and older than, than people think that, that she is. She's been in more than one body, human form. And when the time comes, if it is time for her to go on, it has been chosen that she still has, I mean, it's known that she still has life or years to go, again, she will be put into the body the essence of her and the reptilian form will go, or the essence of her will go into another body that is also has the ability to shape shift into reptilian form. One of, the, one of the pure reptilian human bloodlines? Yes. What happens when, take the Queen Mother as, as an example, what happens when they shape shift? I mean, what do you see? Uh, you start to see changes happen and they're happening so fast uh, that it's almost it, it's it's the closest thing that I I've seen to it is uh, what they're now doing with computer technology it just it, it's just a, a literal transformation that happens very quickly and they get taller and they get bigger and um, they're they don't look at all as, as reptilians like they do as humans. Um, and thus, the wearing of the robes, because if they were in clothes, the clothes would be torn apart. So, so let's take the Queen Mother on this subject as an example. We recognize her as a frail old lady. Um, what does she look like when she shapeshifts at these rituals? She has, uh, she looks like she she the nose portion gets very much longer and it grows into kind of a snout kind of thing she has little fangs um, and and incisors as as teeth and there's a tongue they all seem to have this kind of tongue uh, when they're in, in at this level the tongue has a lot of long uh, hairy or pointed projection, projections coming out of it. It's very long. And um, they have these, they don't have hands or feet. They have these, these 
claws. Um, and they have um, scales and, the, and also scales that seem to kind of disappear into one another. Um, but it, it's, it's more um, um, pronounced on the back. There seem to be lumps or protrusions coming from the head. Um, there seem to be some kind of, of growth uh, appendages at where, you know, on the back. And I, they, they seem folded. And not all of them have that. Um, and there is a tail, and they a lot of times will keep the tail curled and when the, when I mean when and I've seen her when she's very uh, displeased with something as I've seen other members like this uh, this tail is whipped around um, very agitated and they do and she and she hisses what, what, what color are they? Um, which one in particular the, the, take, take the Queen Mother as an example she's um, kind of a beige color on the underside and by the time you're going up around to the back and, and the tail and the top of the head and, and on top of the the nose, snout, whatever, it, it's coming to a very, uh, they're dark spreckles of, or large spreckles of dark browns and um, the eyes usually, they're very, they're large, they look like they're very round and they look like they're coming out of their sockets and um, very protruding and uh, usually the color ranges um, from a beige to a gold to a dark greenish gold and then there's this dark slit up and down uh, a vertical slit and um, when and, and the eyes will look hooded, um, and when they look hooded, it's a very frightening thing because it seems that when the eyes are hooded, uh, they're about to do something. What do you mean by hooded? The the lids come down, and they it, like there. It's almost I guess it would be the same thing in a human as an expression of of. It's someone's got an idea. And how tall are they when, when they shape shift? They're about, just about seven feet tall. Um, some are, some are st a little shorter, um, or to a foot shorter. Uh, some are a little bit taller than seven feet. So what, what would the Queen and Prince Charles look like in their reptilian form? As to height? As to general appearance, there they well. Charles resembles um, Charles resembles uh, in both ways in human form and in uh, in reptilian. Re he resembles Pindar. He's shorter though in in reptilian form than Pindar, but he then. The the way that the uh, the reptilian the, the nose shapes into the snout at that point, and the jaw becomes the under part. Um, it it it's very um, much like Pindar, and his mother doesn't um, look quite the same. As he does. Um, but what does the queen look like? The queen. She's. She's uh, darker, um, not quite so pale. She's darker um, all over. She doesn't have the amount of. of I, I would call it freckling. Um, it's more like a gradual, uh, like the skin is gradually getting darker 
it's more smooth. And she does have the lumps up on or around her head and down the tail of the spine. Charles has the, the, the tails from down around the spine. And funny enough, he has the, uh, the uh, protrusions from the skull in the, in the reptilian form where about or above, right above where it seems like his ears would have been. What, um, what is it about the rituals that allow the shape-shifting to happen? Um, when they, when they, the victims are starting to be sacrificed, it's the scent of the blood. And they start shape-shifting at that point in time. And they can hardly wait to get to the blood. There's, it's, it's like it, they're addicted to the, to the blood and um, then the consumption of human flesh that follows. What have you seen the Queen um, or any of the royal family do in relation to that? You've seen them, have you seen them sacrifice and, and, uh, and uh, consume human flesh? There are certain times when they will actually do a sacrifice or there will have been someone doing a sacrifice and it's not happening fast enough for them. So they will step in and finish it themselves because it, the sacrifice has, the ritual has to be gone through. If sacrificially, I mean ritualistically, it has to have been gone through. And they will step right in and just start tearing this, this th the throat out. And... Um, they're getting all this blood from the jugular vein at the same time. And that has happened when they, when there are many there that are going to be sacrificed and they just can't wait. And then tearing into um, the contents of, of the uh, abdomen and stomach of a victim afterwards. Who have you seen do that? I've seen uh, the Queen Mother do that, and Prince Philip and Charles. Um, I've seen um, uh, Guy de Rothschild do this. Um, it seems that I've seen it more among royalty or so-called so royalty do this than people that are, are not titled, that they don't seem to, they seem like they, it feels like they don't dare, but they 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 shape shift nonetheless. But it's like the royals that step in and just start tearing away, as they can hardly wait. How long can they hold the reptilian form in this occasion? In during the rituals, it's much easier for them to hold their reptilian form. They can stay in that form. What is the, what? What it is is that they can They have a hard time holding their human form. And uh, as long as they're around blood and the scent of blood, they can't hold human form. Right. Where do you think the um, story of Diana fits into all this? In terms of the ritual that you you know about and the royal family background that you know about. What was, what was all that about, what happened in Paris? Diana was a ritual sacrifice because she's named after goddess Diana. She was chosen from before birth for the purpose of which she served. I understand and very well and am very empathetic uh, towards Diana because in a way it parallels what happened to me to have served your purpose, had two children, and then be thrown, tossed aside. And um, to her horror, though, she obviously never attending a ritual, she <laughs> knew something was happening, and uh, she knew what was going on and could not be trusted 
to be at a ritual anyways. I And I don't think that Diana would have attended a ritual. Um, I don't think that that they could get her to cooperate in the, in this app because she actually saw for herself that this was going on after she married Charles. Um, was there any way um, when Diana was married to Charles without attending a blood ritual that she could have seen him or one of the others become a reptile? They have a tendency when they're asleep uh, to shape shift and not they have they have to consciously hold their form and when they're asleep um, they have a tendency to not hold human form and to shape shift uh, into reptilians and um, there could be other things that happen you know I'm thinking about the times that Diana would have would have gone through a menstrual period, well, that would have uh, also uh, really triggered some of these people in the royal family that are reptilian around her to want to shape shift, or any any woman, any human woman in in that household that would be having a period would tend, that scent of blood would tend to. Uh, cause a momentary shape shift. What was the whole, um, what appears to be a ceremony um, surrounding her assassination? What was that about? Um, the the rumors that she was pregnant, um, the Egyptian Dodi fired, um, and the place where it all happened, which is an ancient sacrificial site to the goddess Diana. Um, how does all that fit together in the rituals that you know about? Um, okay, the 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 crown aspect of the goddess is uh, Hecate, and the day of Hecate is on August thirteenth. And what what is very prevalent in in uh, this. With, with the Illuminati and what they've done with the Druidism and other and, and Egypt the Egyptian religions is they like to mirror the numbers and so as as like for example with the goddess Isis her number is 18 uh, when you mirror it it's 81 and that is that is the uh, um, number of the sister of Isis, Nephthys, and Nephthys uh, was considered the evil sister to Isis. Um, with Hecate, what what I think happened here is that she was sacrificed, and it was a very important sacrifice because uh, three people died. And it was a it was a picture of the triad of Isis, Osiris, and Horus to them. Horus being the unborn child of Dodi Fayed that Diana carried, and was three months old, which is another very important fact, a number that's important to them to be three months old. Uh, sacrificial babies are taken in utero at three, five, and seven months. And um, when I when I heard about this, this was a deal that I understood now had gone down, and um, she had to die in that tunnel because that tunnel is the passageway for Diana, the goddess, and um, she died at the thirteenth pillar again because of Hecate and uh, she died on the 31st because it's the mirror image of 13 and um, my my understanding of, of what I get inside of me and because I was told by Baron Guy de Rothschild last 
beginning of February when he was in this country and he was uh, there to re try and reprogram me again and impregnate me was that he was in the tunnel that night he had to be there because not only was it a ritual death of Diana this was also about taking her soul and he was taking the soul of Diana which no one else there could do whoever was present there could not do it he could do it and he was in France this is the hypnotic stare you talk about yes and drawing in the breath and um, he had to be there to do this ritual killing this ritual murder this would mean that the ambulance team and uh, a doctor that arrived within a minute of the crash coming the other way um, must have been in on this whole deal um, or at least the people in charge of the ambulance team um, from your experience of the kind of people involved in this Illuminati satanic network uh, do you think that's possible that, that they could set that up yes I do uh, I've seen a lot of things set up uh, that if you did not know if you were in on the so-called inner circle or know what what the Illuminati can do because they depend on people not believing they're really there you would not uh, you would have a hard time believing it uh, that this has been such a secretive group and worked in in such insidious ways to infiltrate and control and um, this there are so many unanswered questions they don't seem to be able to answer about Diana that keep coming up in spite of all the reports that come out because there are people that don't believe what they're hearing what would have been the purpose of creating such a, uh, a clear and definite ritual in the assassination of Diana what would be the purpose of, of that when they could have killed her in another way because it had to be done as a, as a ritual because they were going to take her soul and um, it had to happen in the tunnel it had to happen that way it had to happen in that year and this is all there's all a timeline to all of this there's been many rumors that she was pregnant um, but uh, as I understand it one of her friends says that that was not possible because she knew that very shortly before uh, she uh, had a menstrual period um, is it possible to be uh, pregnant and for that to still happen yes it is uh, this happened to me uh, I was impregnated uh, with one of my own fertilized egg that was fertilized by uh, this sperm of Pindar uh, and uh, he sent Gita Rothschild to, to impregnate me in this manner and uh, I was impregnated in October of 94 I had periods up until February when it was discovered and they seemed normal uh, not light and uh, I then was since I had the background of a nurse I was and had worked deliver with a nurse midwife delivering babies I was for some reason it occurred to me to check my stomach my abdomen and I realized that I was pregnant and so I ended up uh, seeing a doctor who told me I mean he, he uh, verified you're pregnant he did it with blood test with the urine test and uh, ultrasound exam and if I don't um, do an abortion on you tomorrow uh, you're going to have to go through a different type of abortion which probably would have been a saline abortion and I knew what I was pregnant with by that time and so I was terrified 
to go through with it. I did, could not go through with it, knowing what I knew, and so I had the abortion. But I had periods the whole time. You were impregnated at the point that it happened without you having any knowledge of it. No, I did not. Is it possible that that happened to Diana um, if she was as... Um, the evidence that I've looked at suggests um, also um, mind-controlled and a multiple from the early part of her life. That That is definitely more than a probability. Um, the, the thing about being multiple or, or dissociative identity disorder is that the host uh, person doesn't know that they are, but they have missing time, but then they have amnesia for the missing time. They don't realize they're missing time. They don't realize things are happening to them. They, they show up, you know, pregnant. They show up with marks on their bodies. They don't know, well, I, oh, I think I must have bumped myself, and that's not actually how it happened. Or they have needle marks on their body when they've been gotten a hold of and drugged. And um, it's only when they start to realize something's not right and they try and make a timeline and try and account for their time, they realize there's so much they can't account for that they simply took for granted. Oh, I was out shopping, or I was at this person's house, or I was over there. Then they realize they don't have a time, a timeline for any of these things. Do you think that... Um Diana's two children were, were Prince Charles' children? Um, I do not believe that William is... I've heard that he was... Uh, Ed, um, Charles' son, I've heard of, about someone else, and I believe that it was neither. I believe that, that this child of Prince William is the son of Pindar and she was impregnated and does not real and she did not realize that when you um, you look at the 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 ritual uh, nature of all that you've got um, Osiris it would seem symbolized by dirty fire you've got Isis symbolized by Diana presumably the baby quite obviously symbolizes Horus in Egyptian legend and ritual. Why, why create that in a tunnel in Paris at that time? What was it designed to do, to symbolize or whatever? It's to symbolize, it's, it's part of symbolizing getting ready, getting the world ready to recognize uh, the Horus that is about to come upon us in the year 2000, as the year 2000 is the age of Horus and Osiris reborn, and there's a sacrifice involved, and the sacrifice is um, the mother, and the sacrifice is, is this child, and yet it involves another child who yet lives by the same mother. And um, You're talking about William? Yes, I am talking about William. What would have happened to Diana in your experience of the ritual, um, and what would have happened to the unborn child um, after the uh, events in the tunnel in Paris? That Diana left the tunnel dead. She didn't leave that tunnel alive. That would, that ritual, she had to die in that tunnel. And they had to take her soul in that tunnel. And they had to take the soul or developing soul or developing essence of the unborn child. And in the hospital, it follows logically according to what I know about what they do that they would have taken the uterus and the fetus from 
Diana that that would have been taken and as a ritual that would have been taken and they would have removed other body parts and, and done what? distributed them for uh, high Illuminati members to consume because this is a ritual sacrifice some strange things happened um, after that strange things happened all the way through it but suddenly um, the decision was made that she would not be buried in the local church where she wanted to be buried but on an island among the trees in a lake at Althorpe Park and Earl Spencer her brother claims through a dream he was inspired to put four black swans on the lake therefore from your again knowledge of the ritual what what does all that mean why do that because four black swans have they have to do with four directions four seasons um, they have to do with sealing something for all eternity to have four of something black like that swan's figure um, in Celtic mythology quite a bit in the Druid mythology and black is the color of Hecate and uh, one of the also one of the goddess aspects the three goddess aspects that they have the name is is black flame or black star and black flame is means like means unto death and so therefore the color black and somewhere in there would be a flame the decisions after her death to put her on an island among the trees in a lake and the four black swans were all at least on the surface taken by her brother Earl Spencer have you any experience of him Earl Spencer I have seen at rituals he's definitely tied into it her family has been a uh, part of this she has this bloodline I have not seen him uh, shapeshift but he's tied into it you've seen him at rituals in yes which I have sacrifices took place yes I have uh, what about her father any any uh, knowledge of him her father was present at rituals her um, her father would have have to be have been involved way before Diana was born um, for her to to have been involved in I mean and watch her actions after she was married cutting herself being anorexic being bulimic um, just these are, are are so indicative of someone who has been involved in mind control has been hurt has and and has been forced to follow mind programming um, that this would have started when she was a little child and her father would have been involved so if they uh, got her into this mind control stream from birth um, presumably they would have been able to shape events right from that point to the thirteenth pillar yes yeah they would have they when when somebody uh, is becomes what what we call uh, multiple personality disorder or dissociative identity disorder um, there are, are many programs that are induced that can be induced at any point I mean you've got the machinery in place when they're a very small child and when and as they're as they're grown they they can install programs at any point and have different parts hold these programs and they can be made to do just about anything um, they they're taught things such as um, red light is a green light go through the light um, they drive faster than they realize they're driving um, they 
are able to memorize or, or see, just glance at something and right away just pick what, what the point is that they're going after for some reason or they, they can memorize phone numbers in just a, just a glance. The car hit the 13th pillar, driven by Henri Paul, who uh, was missing for three hours that night, a man who's been connected to both British and French intelligence. Given the obsession with the number 13, it seems uh, beyond coincidence that with all those pillars in the tunnel, it hit the 13th. Is it possible to mind control someone like Henri Paul? so that at speed they could pick out the 13th tunnel, uh, the 13th pillar? Yes. Yes, it is. Um, they, he also, it's very, very possible that, that he was drugged and programmed in the time he was missing. Um, it's possible for him to have taken medication but not have it affect him at all. Does that include alcohol? Alcohol also, yeah. And then maybe later or not it would affect him, depending on if that's what the program was for it to affect him. Um, but it might not affect someone at all. I've been through this myself, um, so I know this to be true. And What happened to you in this instance? Uh, it was a very bad time in my life, the one time in particular I would, I'm speaking of where my then husband told me that he wanted a divorce and I took uh, approximately eight, um, I don't remember what the, what the dosage was, but eight Xanax pills in front of him and I drove from where I lived in Orange County to uh, the Norwalk area and went to see my therapist who was holding some groups in this area and I did not feel the effects of the pills at all when I drove to see him. I did not feel the effects of the pills at all when I left there an hour and a half later. And I had no car accidents, I was not stopped. My driving skills were very good, um, and I've seen this happen with other people that have had the mind control uh, programming and, and this uh, DID, and um, you just swallow up medication, and one part holds on to it, and it does not affect the body. So if you're in a compartment that is not connected to taking the pills, you, you, you're not affected by it. But if you were put into that compartment that uh, took the pills, if you like, um, you would be affected by them. Yes, and you can also have, what, what they can do with you is have a whole bunch of, of alters or parts lined up that, okay, you will be out from this point to this point and then you, this next part, will be out at this, from this point to this point. They can keep going like that. It can be a very complicated, long thing, but they can line them up that way. It's, uh, that's the way the programming goes. Do you think this could explain the apparent mystery of an um, alcohol reading of Henri Paul that was equivalent to eight, eight Scottish on an empty stomach, um, while the video evidence of the Ritz Hotel security cameras uh, is that this was not a man in the minutes before he drove Diana into the tunnel um, that was in any way at that level of um, drunkenness. Yes, that, that can very well explain it. Um, you, with this kind of, of mind control programming that they do, um, once you go into that mode that they want you in, um, you can be hurt and in a lot of pain, or you can be drugged to the gills, um, or have drunk too much, uh, and you appear to be in no pain at all, appear to be perfectly with it, 
um, and you don't feel it. You feel all right. People would find it difficult just coming from their own ex uh, kind of uh, experience and observation that someone could drive a car into a tunnel at uh, considerable speed and, and pick out among 30 odd the 13th pillar. Um, how, how, is, how is that possible for, to program someone to do that? Because that someone has been taught and programmed and taught and programmed and taught from, for quite a while how to do this at a very fast speed. The mind works very fast and if if they have the mind and body connected the right way uh, they can drive they would have been able this person would have been able to drive into the 13th pillar at a fast speed would that have been happening on a conscious level or would the subconscious have been pulling the strings this would be on a subconscious level and the person would not be aware themselves of what they were doing in those crucial minutes before um, Henri Paul got in the car and drove away would someone have had to have given him the trigger to a access and activate the programming then? Or could he have been in some way pre-programmed to be triggered at that time? And if so, what would that be? Well, he was probably programmed to do all of this at a trigger signal. And so what happened is that somebody triggered him with a preset signal that he was told when when you are given this signal you will act out you know and, and but the program was already set to go off when the trigger uh, when he saw the trigger what form could this trigger have taken it could have been a hand signal it could have been a certain type of handshake it could have been a color that he saw that was flashed in front of his face um, it could have been a certain person doing a, a, a hand signal. It's, it's most likely that it was there was a person present that he was to react to when this person said something or signaled him in some way. Given the extent of your uh, programming from birth, uh, how was it possible for you to break out of it um, as you? appear to have done now. One thing that happened is that in 1989 my programmer handler died who was Mengele and he was in this country so much and I was around him so much and he had a lot of control over me um, and what happens when a programmer handler dies uh, they usually have taught the person that they've been working on, working with, uh, to be very, very loyal unto death to them. And that's something that, that they, uh, in the end, it, 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 is, uh, it works against everything because when they die, uh, even someone else coming in and trying to take over uh, the, a lot of these uh, altars are not open to that and are loyal to that one person and in my case um, Baron Guy de Rothschild is the one that tried to take over and for some number of years there was a lot of the time, half the time they got their way and half the time they didn't, um, and in major things, uh, they didn't. <laughs> they did not get their way. Um, one of the things that I went out and did in 1993 was I cut my hair off, and because I was uh, publicly seen and known to have very, very long hair, um, I could no longer be seen. I could not be seen with my hair cut off short this would have caused a lot of questions with other people that had been programmed and um, they still tried to carry on with other parts where I wouldn't have to be publicly seen because they still consider me to hold this status and they still consider me their property 
I was always told I was their property. One, one question that people would, would, would ask is, is, given all that you know, um, why don't they just take you out? They still have plans for me, and this was uh, told to me just a few days ago by someone else uh, who has been, who has spoken with, with Baron Guy de Rothschild that they have plans for me. And uh, they plan to, try to have me back because of the psychic abilities. And um, that is not going to happen. In the little bit of tape we've got left, um, can we just, just turn the subject to the jury uh, you've got to, to, to your left there? Um, what, 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 what is that? Was that part of the ritual that you were, rituals that you were involved in? The first one, this is a child's ring. It is a 14 karat gold white, or 14 karat white gold ring with a diamond in the middle of a hexagram or a, he a hexagonal shape and it forms, it looks like a hexagon if you were able to look closely at the diamond. This was returned to me by my ex-husband who told me, well this was in your daughter's clothes and this was a message to me and it was a trigger to me for him to do this. Very, well any, any uh, high-ranking survivors that I have talked to that know of this ring know that it's from Mothers of Darkness. And this, it's, it would be very unusual. I mean, I don't know of anyone else that has a ring like this in their possession at this point in time. And, and what's the uh, necklace? The necklace here is made out of copper and it's very Egyptian and it was given to me when I turned 19 and that's an important age because you really start at the position I was at uh, having these psychic powers in full effect and being allowed to do this in full effect during rituals and this was worn during certain rituals. Why copper and why, why, why have it at all? Copper is a transmitter. Copper is you has always been used in the occult. Um, it has a specific meaning. It has the meaning it has is because I had a triad of altars that were very active in a lot of rituals, and the triad was Isis, Osiris, and Horus. And Isis was the part that drew down the moon. And Osiris performed the rituals, and Horus was what was born of performing those rituals. Just in the literally three minutes we got left, for three or four minutes, um, I, I know it's difficult, but um, I want people to understand the nature of what's going on to so many people today. What sort of things were done to you as part of your traumatization as a child and later? I was electroshocked to the extent that and that I, my parents were told when I was in first grade that my IQ was 70 and that I was retarded and they said I would be retarded. Um, I always had trouble in school because when I was in school because I missed so much school. My school records are missing. They've just disappeared. Um, I have medical records that are missing. Um, my birth certificate appears to have been tampered with. Um, I have had my eyelids taped open and so I couldn't shut my eyes. I have been electroshocked. I've been put into a narcoleptic sleep and had earphones placed over my ears and had messages repeated and repeated for days. Um, I've had drugs uh, injected into my body so that my nerves were just like on fire and then they would just touch me. I've had, since I wasn't allowed to have marks on my body, they couldn't use a cattle prod on me, but they do use cattle prods on people uh, in torturing them and they do use electrical stimulation to the genitals uh, and also on the teeth. 
and uh, they like to inject between the toes and be under the fingernails and up in the gums. Um, I've also had some kind of scarring done up through the roof of my mouth all the way up to the brain stem back here that gives me a photographic memory and I have calcium blocks around the pineal gland that seem to be perfectly spaced and, and even and it's very very uh, curious the doctors can't seem to come up with a reason for that um, I have been programmed to be anorexic, to be bulimic um, for the government programming since I was also used by this uh, the government in this country, I was programmed to cut my arms if I started to remember, which I was punished for by the Illuminati, as I was not to have these marks upon myself. Um, I have, I was made to eat my own feces as a little child. I was made to drink my own urine. I was not allowed to go to the bathroom. I was placed in a sensory deprivation tank. I had my shoulders, my knees, my toes, and my fingers, my elbows dislocated and then put back into place when they wanted me to be traumatized. Um, I've had repeatedly had phone calls of tones coming over my phone and tones that you can't make by pressing telephone buttons, tones that sound like sonar sounds from a submarine. Um, tones that sound like they were made by some type of instrument and I have had directed energy used on me, ELF, uh, low frequency electric waves used on me, microwave energy and this in turn created has created uh, two different, I have would hear uh, one tone in one ear, one tone in a different tone in the other ear, it creates a third tone, they're called tritones, they change the electrical activity of your brain waves and uh, to put you in the state they want you in. Um, I have been programmed to run through red light thinking it's green. Um, I've been, there's been a lot of programming done around my children. They've used my children against me. And it's a very painful subject with me um, to know that this is happening to my children. The same thing that's happened to me. I, it's hard, it's easier. I don't, I don't know if I can make people understand this. It's easier for me to have, okay, I can handle that I went through this. And what I want most is to expose these people because of what they're doing to children all over. But they, they're doing it to my children too. And my daughter believes I've abandoned her. My son believes I abandoned him. Um, and they don't have hope when they're, when, when they're children. They, they don't have hope when their mother's taken away from them. And they're told that their mother just left them. So this is something, this is a cycle that goes on with thousands and thousands of survivors, not just myself. And this is how they perpetuate it if there is a parent that's protective that believes and has found out this is happening. The astonishing revelations of Arizona Wilder, a very, very brave lady who's chosen to stand up and be counted. And only by enough people doing that is this nonsense and this manipulation going to be brought to an end, as it is in the next few years. Well, we've come to a, the end of our little tour of the center of global control, and we're here now outside the Houses of Parliament in London the so-called mother of parliaments because of course it has provided the blueprint for so many other so-called democracies all around the world when in fact it's just another vehicle for the one-party state that is relentlessly turning out legislation advancing this global centralization agenda not a place of democracy at all a place for legislating the agenda into reality well, you've heard the information and possibly read it in the biggest secret at greater length also. The question is, what are we going to do about it? 
that's entirely up to you as an individual and me as an individual. Um, as someone once said, what you think of me is none of my business, and it's not. This is just information, make of it what you will. But what we make of it and what we decide to do in the light of this knowledge will decide the kind of world that we and our children are going to live in in the next few years and beyond. The Chinese have a word that means at the same time both danger, crisis and opportunity. And that's the situation we're in now. Yes, there's a crisis. Yes, there's a danger of this global fascist state becoming reality, but it's also an opportunity. An opportunity to wake up and make the change that will turn this planet from a prison into the paradise it once was and the paradise it will become again. And that is about choice. Choosing what we do as a result of what we know. And I quote um, in my books a number of times an American comedian called Bill Hicks, a genius in his way, very angry man, but a very brilliant man, a very profound man. And he described life in this way. He said, life's like a ride in an amusement park. And when you go on it, you think it's real because that's how powerful our minds are. The ride goes up and down, round and round. It has thrills and chills and it's very brightly colored and it's very loud and it's fun for a while. Some have been on the ride for a long time and they remember and they come back to us and they say, hey, don't be afraid ever because this is just a ride. And we kill those people. Shut him up. I've got a lot invested in this ride. Shut him up. Look at my furrows of worry and my family and my big bank account. This has to be real. It's just a ride. But we always kill those good guys who try to tell us that and let the demons run amok. But it doesn't matter because it's just a ride. And we can change it anytime we want. In other words, it's just a reflection of our own attitudes. And to change, as Bill Hicks said, doesn't need big bank accounts. It just means a choice right now between fear and love. Fear is the four-letter word that has controlled this planet and this human race for thousands of years. Love is the word that will set us free. And that's the choice we face now. And the world that those two choices will create will be so different as to be unexplainable. The chasm between the two. A prison or a paradise. I just want to say one other thing before we finish this video. I don't want to demonize the reptilian race because it's just a genetic stream in the great forever. I'm talking about a small number of this reptilian race that is behind this manipulation, not the race in general. And indeed, many of the reptilian stream, both in physical bodies and in other dimensions, are working now to help humanity win their freedom, win our freedom back. And I'd like to thank once again also Arizona Wilder for having the guts to stand up and speak her truth. And if enough people do that, then this house of cards, because that's all it is in the end, is going to fall. And I'd like to thank also my friend Brian Desborough for helping Arizona and for his own commitment to truth. We're now at the crossroads of the evolution of the human race, or a crossroads anyway. And the good news is this, there is a global awakening going on. I've spoken in something like 20 countries in the last 18 months. People are waking up, they're asking questions, they're seeing themselves and the world in a different light. And this is going to gather pace and is gathering pace all the time. And it's this transformation of human thought and perception that is going to bring the change that we dreamed about for so long. Dreams are merely imagination which can be made reality if we're prepared to do what is necessary to, to achieve that. That's the challenge we face now. It's a wonderful, wonderful time to be alive and we're all privileged to be here to play a part in setting this world free for the first time in known human history. From the epicenter of global control, but not for very much longer. Thanks for listening. Goodbye.